Today, I'm welcoming another longtime friend, Ifan Shea, here to explore the spiritual path with food. And I have known Ifan for, gosh, 12 years, but we reconnected recently. And I'll share a little bit more about that story. But first, I just want to say that Ifan is a lifelong learner. She's an adventurer and coach trained at the Kesser Institute's ADAPT Functional Health Coach Training Program. As a functional health coach, she partners with her clients to uplevel their well being in areas of life, making sustainable shifts in their lifestyle, behavior, and mindset. She especially enjoys empowering Asian and BIPOC women to break out of burnout to get more energy, time, and balance so they can live life on their own terms. Ifan and I met at the Vermont Wilderness School back in 2010 in the wintry deep snow of, of Vermont. And seems like um, another lifetime ago. It does. It was. And um, Ifan was a staff member and I was a volunteer um, for homeschooled children, middle school age, um, assisting them to learn wild foraging techniques, um, working with knives, friction, fire, um, and really, yeah. And self-empowerment. And so um, that was the beginning really of my introduction to my drive to learn wilderness skills, to be more connected to the land and to myself and to other people essentially. Um, and when we had met, I was already steeped in my relationship with food, intentional relationship with food. And it's so interesting for us to have reconnect over a decade later to connect on food. Um, so welcome Ifan. I'm so excited to you know, meet each other again in this new paradigm and be able to share our shared journey, but very different and parallel journeys with food. So welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction, Becca. And yeah, it does feel like it's full circle because when we met, it was like another phase of my life, like I mentioned, and I was really involved with um, very direct connection to nature. And I've had a lot of adventures since then and had my own health journey, kind of, you know, I, I lived in a lot of different countries. So I, I lived in Colorado first, um, and then I moved to Guatemala and bought a one-way ticket there. And over the years, I've been there three different times, and I ended up starting a nonprofit organization down there, helping the indigenous people, um, artisans to make handmade shoes. And so after that, I went to Taiwan and I lived there for seven years. So through all that experience of living in different countries, I've really kept this nature connection close to my heart. And um, food is a huge part of our connection to nature. And um, it's also what healed me when I went through my own health crisis in Taiwan, which came from just you know, kind of caught up with me from a lot of food poisoning and taking antibiotics and adapting to different climates and cultures, different foods, eating street food, eating not healthily. Um, it really was reconnecting with those roots from where we met that I started to heal myself. And so it feels really appropriate to talk about food. And I love that yin yang because i was coming towards nature connection having had a deep connection to food and agriculture and i pivoted so it's just so neat to see how we kind of sw swapped places and are meeting back here again with both experiences and both versions of you know looking through that window can you talk a little bit more about how food can be a spiritual path i know that we've both had more indigenous experiences with food from our upbringing and our cultures. And I think that that, you know, leads to a really rich conversation. So I'm curious to hear your perspective on that. Yeah. So, you know, food is such a complex topic and yet it's so simple. It's something that we all need to consume in order to live. Um, and I think of, you know, I think of the difference between plants and animals kind of plants are brought into the world with they have a store of energy and seeds and that's what uh, allows them. And then their food is sunlight, um, but they can survive for so long without that sunlight and just wait for the right conditions to grow. And then humans, we, we are nurtured by our mothers. And actually this is like so interesting, like food and nutrition um, 
it comes from this like where I looked up this etymology because I'm really into that. It comes from uh, nourish comes from the word matrix. So that's like to nurse like a baby and to flow. And so really nutrition and food is the root of that is to be nourished by our mothers, by our mother's milk and the, the milk of our mothers. So it even goes as far as like ancient Greek, it's like I flow. And when we talk about food as um, a spiritual path, it's, it's being in balance with what nourishes us, but not just so that we can survive. We're not only these bodies, we are a vessel so that we can create, so that we can connect, we, we can experience, and we can contribute to the world's our special gifts. And um, food is something physical that we consume, but it's also energy that we are getting from our environment, from our connections. And um, what is it that we're absorbing from our surroundings and from the materials that we put in our bodies that is really going to help build the most optimal vessel for us to do our work in the world. So that's how I see nutrition and food. Um, it's something that's really basic, but also very primal and um, powerful. Well, when you talk about nurturing from the mother, I immediately connect to mother earth, right? So mm -hmm. as we step away from our mother's milk, then, then we start to ingest from the earth. Can you talk yeah. a little bit more about the historical and cultural and religious implications of food? That's a big topic. So, you know, I, I, I would start from the level of individual experience, um, just to make it more simple for people. So for me, um, food was like a cultural experience because, you know, I'm Chinese um, and my, I've had a lot of different cultural experiences with food. And I find that having lived within, you know, in the US within my own like little cultural pod of my family and then living in Guatemala and living in Taiwan, um, there, every, every culture has its own traditions with food. And these traditions go back generations and generations. Um, these are kind of like beliefs that we have around food. So not only beliefs, but they're also different traditions that are actually um, passed down that, for, for example, in, um, in Taiwan, there's after a mother gives birth, there is one month that we call zuo yue, it means sit the month. And that means it's a month where the mother, she doesn't go out socially, uh, she doesn't wash her hair. She is really just connecting with her baby and she's eating a special kind of food. And these are food that are like packed with nutrients. And so they have like, there's actually centers in Taiwan where you can go and um, they've become, it's become a service. So what I'm saying is that this is this is a cultural wisdom that's passed down. Like after the mother gives birth, this is how you really nourish the mother's body and the baby. Um, but it's also a spiritual component. Like there is a wisdom there of, um, along with that nutrition, we need to set clear boundaries, not let anyone else visit the mother while she's doing this recovery from birth. So I would say, you know, my intention for this very big topic is is that right now there's so much confusion around food and there's a lot of anxiety that people have. And it's so easy to look at in our modern times at like Dr. Google and just, you know, uh, you know, what's the best source of blah, 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 nutrition, right? Uh, or like, oh no, my doctor told me that I should, actually doctors don't even really talk about nutrition. That's another topic, but um, you might hear something and you feel anxiety about something you say, okay, like, um, that you look up a condition and then you think, okay, what do I need to eat? Or what, like, what am I deficient in, in order to um, boost my, my own nutrition so that I can heal myself from this condition, right? And then you go down this rabbit hole of like, okay, I, oh my gosh, I'm deficient in this. I might be deficient in this. And so you go and buy supplements for that. And then later on you find out, okay, well, maybe I'm not absorbing these supplements very well, or I'm just peeing them out and they cost so much money. And, oh my gosh, there's companies that are ripping people off. And there's like, we just get spun into this web of confusion and anxiety and lack around food. Um, and this is actually a thing that um, 
I know I'm kind of going along for a, a while, but I'm basically, you know, like we have a simple connection to food and it comes from our ancestors um, and our ancestors' worldview. So that's like the point is like, if we just go back to your own ancestors and their beliefs and traditions around food, that's a good starting point for you. I love that. I think, you know, what we're picking up on is the disconnection from ourselves that leads to disordered eating. And when we start to seek outside of ourselves, outside of our traditions, outside of our lineage is when we get disoriented. And that's the same with emotional health, right? It's a, mm -hmm. it's a complete mirror. So especially in American culture, there's so much rush and fast food and, you know, idea, fad diet. So it's, everything's fleeting. It's all fast. And indigenous yeah, and food is much convenience. Indigenous food really includes a lot more slow down intention, communal eating ceremony. And, you know, outside of food, those things are what help people balance their nervous system and get into a more meditative life practice. And so it's not a surprise that this is the same with food. However, our world has become so colonized that it's become this commodity and this, you know, flashy thing that's, you know, not, it's not the focus anymore. And the mm -hmm. focus is not on us anymore. So bringing back the focus back to ourselves exploring and, and not everyone has the ability to find out um you know what their heritage is or um what their lineage is and so it might be a little bit more complicated to dig deep if if we can't ask our mothers or our grandmothers um you know what they were doing in the kitchen so what would you suggest to people who might not even realize what their lineage is when it comes to food yeah that's a great question and i love that summary that you did that was such a beautiful um you know, tour de force of all these different components and so well said. So it's, it's true, you know, we're not, we're not all able to ask our mothers and our grandmothers, um, you know, the people that are usually in the kitchen and what, what did you do? You know, what, what, how much of this do I put in? And there's kind of like this meme going around. Um, it's like, I don't follow recipes. I just, you know, sprinkle this and that until my answers, ancestors say, bibbidi boop, you know, something like that. Um, and I always laugh at that because that my mother always, whenever I try to ask her for a recipe, like even if I try to get information from her, it's really like a, you have to experience it. You have to like, she makes dumplings, right? That's our family, um, you know, our family heritage. And she learned from her grand, from her mother as well. And I'm just like, well, how much of this do you put in? She's like, well, you just, you know, use your hands and you need it until it feels like, and it feels right. And I'm just like, oh, that's so frustrating, right? It's like different every time, but, but it is that personal connection. And I would say if you don't have someone to ask, um, that's okay, because you can make your own traditions around food. You can have your own connection and relationship to food. That's sensorial, where you're, you're tapping into your intuition, you're tasting it, you're salting it to taste, right? Um, you're making it taste good to you and your body because your body has the wisdom inside of you where you know what is good for you. And so there are even people who do muscle testing around food. Um, you know, they'll tap into whatever tool you have for tapping into your intuition. Is this food good for me? Is this food not so good for me? Should I hold off on this food or whatever it is for now? Um, there's even people who say like, there's a form of like you hold a food in your hand and you close your eyes and uh, you're standing. And then you ask, you know, is this good for me? Is this, should I hold off on this? And you can lean, you, your body will like lean forward if it's a yes. And it will kind of like lean backwards if it's a no. And it's just like an intuitive knowing. So there's all these different ways to explore what your own connection is. And I've always wondered, in the past, like, this is a question that maybe you've had. How did indigenous people know what was poisonous and what was good to eat and what was not good to eat? Like, it always just boggled my mind. Like, how do they know the best nutrition, like nourishing things at the right times of year and, you know, to dig for certain roots at this time of year? And um, 
how do they know that? And I, I actually, like, this has been a subject of fascination for me for a long time. So I read one story recently that, and I don't remember the exact tribe, but it might've been in Samoa. It was somewhere in the um, Pacific Islands. And um, this group of people, this indigenous group uh, of hunter-gatherers, they would like, if they were not sure about a plant, they would uh, lick it. They would lick, they crush like slightly, like crush the leaf a little bit and it'd smell it. And they like lick a little piece of it and then they would wait. And so that's like, you know, and, they, and their bodies would tell them. And then there's another um, story of just like, you know, when we plant seeds, we put, put the seeds in our mouth and you hold it there and we're kind of imprinting the seeds with the knowledge of what do the seeds need? What do the plants need to express in order to nourish us? So it's kind of like that like direct connection with, with our bodies and with our mind and spirits. You know, what are your thoughts about that? Well, we're tapping back into ceremony again, and one of my favorite topics. So when I did the wilderness skills program out in Northern California, we did a ghost supper, which was overnight. And um, I'm blanking on the name of what it was. I don't think it was Jibby Gajek. I think that's a different ceremony. I'll have to double check this later, but um, a native man from Michigan came out to teach us his lineage of this teaching. And as a group, we were told to go home and choose an ancestral favorite dish and to not taste it until we were sharing it with others. In fact, we weren't to taste it first, others were. And we were instructed to ask whoever it was. So for me, I chose my mother's mother and matzo ball soup. And we were to not taste it, but to ask for guidance and support and ask for a nudge when to stop putting in salt or when to be putting in a different ingredient. And, you know, when like I- when started, the ancestor says, bibbidi boop. That's yes, <laughs> that's exactly what came to mind. And um, that was one of the most pivotal nights for me in my spiritual journey, because um, first of all, everyone loved it. And most people had never had it before. So that was really sweet to share that. Um, but I felt so connected to my grandmother that night and she was dead at this time. And I was in tears. And I remember just looking down at the fire because we were all sitting around different fires. Um, the group had prepared different sections with multiple fires so people could go from fire to fire to each, you know, have a, a, a reception of each meal. So it wasn't all just a group of 30 people doing it all at once. So and I remember it was so amazing. And I remember just crying, looking down at the fire, really feeling her and saying, if you're here, give me a sign and looking up and seeing a shooting star. And oh. this was an initiation for me and really mm -hmm. starting to acknowledge the afterlife. Um, or I, I don't even want to use that word. I don't know what it is, but acknowledging that there is a connection to people who have passed and um, that intention and magic is real. That was one of my big initiatory moments. And- um, your, you know, your grandmother was speaking to you. I, I really felt it. And, I, and, mm -hmm. and there were moments in years later where I asked that same question and got another shooting star. And so it's not something I do frequently, but when I do it, she definitely responds. Mm -hmm. um, and then and I, have I, just, a, I have a funny story about um, offering ancestors food. Okay. Um, it's kind of like completely the opposite, but it's very funny. So, um, at some point in my past, I had dated a man who was indigenous. He was, um, his, his, he was Apache and, um, he had very strong food ceremony connections that he kind of invited me into. And so one of them was the ancestor feast and this was around the day of the dead. So, um, you know, that's like around November, early November. And in, in Chinese culture, we have our own um, cultural traditions around offering our ancestors food. So, but his connection was, so you create a big feast and you cook like, you know, your ancestors favorite meals. You put pictures of the ancestors there and candles and you make a beautiful altar and spread and you leave that food up for, I think it was like seven days it's quite a while, you leave the candles burning and it's like this beautiful altar every day you go and, and you speak to your ancestors. And so he had his side of the family, uh, which is like, you know, like a lot of rice and beans and chili and, you know, like the New Mexico chili, that kind of thing. Um, and then on my side of the family, we, um, my grandfather was a sea cucumber merchant. And so he would, 
he loved, and we, um, my mom's side of the family, they grew up in Korea next to the ocean. So they always loved Korean food and seafood. And so we actually went to a Chinese restaurant and I bought, uh, I bought a meal for my grandfather. And it was like this uh, sauteed sea cucumber dish, which was like, it's like kind of expensive. Um, not something that I could have made like in the kitchen um, on my own. And so uh, we offered that for my grandfather. And after seven days, um, he put it out. He, the, the, the tradition is you put it out on nature as an offering for the land after the offering to the ancestors. So, and that's a tradition in a lot of, a lot of different areas of the world. So I actually had to leave. I was just visiting at that time, but he said that um, after the seven days, he put it out on the land and some like, some like wild dog or animal came and like just ravaged my grandfather's sea cucumber. And he told me, he was like, he saw that what happened. He's like, oh, wow. Like they haven't been fed for a while. And <laughs> I just remember laughing because um, it's true. Like, you know, I had never done that for my grandfather before. I had never had that connection with my grandfather. Um, he was always very distant with me. We, I didn't understand the language of the dialect that he spoke. And he was, you know, like, patriarch of the family. Um, so it was like, I did feel like it was true that like, he was like, oh my goodness, like this is a feast. I'm just gonna dig into it. So it's kind of funny. It was not a shooting star. <laughs> I love that story though, because still it was very visceral. There was something in the environment showing you that energetic. And, you know- Yeah, the dog didn't, didn't do the same thing with all the other food that was out there. <laughs> So ghost supper for us was also around October, November. And mm -hmm. um, in the Jewish tradition, it's Sukkot. And you also um, create an outdoor dwelling out of harvested items with enough sun, um, skylight so you can watch the stars overnight. So the purpose of it is to do everything outdoors in this hut, which is very much um, in reverence of the harvest season. Um, and to be able to see the sky so you're never disconnected from the sky. Uh, and that's all so during that harvest season. And I'm thinking about what do Americans do? We sell about Halloween and go get pre-wrapped individual size candy, mm -hmm. fast sugar produce, mass produced food. That's our ceremony. So just bringing it back to what is the slower, more land-based, more connected to ourselves and to our families mm -hmm. option. Um, so I love right. hearing this. And I also, we did, um, in that program make spirit plates. Um, and, you know, I think as is with any new habit, it's as easy not to do as it is to do, or maybe easier not to do. And so yeah, absolutely. you can get really excited about doing this for a little while, but I think after some time it can get lonely or lose its magic. If it feels like you're alone in it unless you get build a very close relationship to your ancestors so you don't feel alone. Um, but I think community is such a big piece of feeling connected to food because if it is something that you're doing on your own, it can become very isolating, whether it is a restrictive diet or ceremony or what have you. And I think that that's why, you know, around the time you and I met, we were both in communities out in Western Mass that were very food focused. And we would go to potlucks and there would be music and celebration and people would collaborate and people would bring food they grew. And so you and I both had a very, um, you know, different and unique experience with food as an Amer American. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of cultures where this was so ingrained, they were more active about harvesting and growing. And so it was more easy. So what are some... Tech, and I know you guys, you, you and I have talked about this. What are some um, more accessible ways for people who aren't living so close to the land and um, may be in cities or may be the only person in their friend group or family who's even thinking about this thing? What are some little ways that people can start to have more of a sacred relationship to food again? That's a great question. And you know, I went from living on a farm in Western Massachusetts where we grow a lot of our own food and we were just involved in these community supported agriculture, um, that just rich community. And then I went to live in um, Taipei, Taiwan, which is one of the most er densely populated urban centers in the world in a subtropical city where it was like, you know, concrete jungle, um, AC on all the time, like, you know, food desert. 
um, all of the food is, you know, coming into the city, into these grocery stores that would be restocked every day. So, you know, I, I think a great place to start is with gratitude because um, with, with anything that we put into our bodies, like when we put our mindfulness of gratitude into, you know, uh, what is going into our bodies and everything, all the energy that went into our bodies, the sunshine, the rain, even if it was like irrigation, just the water, um, the people whose hands touched the, the harvest to harvest it, or even if it was machine harvest, you know, that's like one thing is there's so much industrial agriculture that it's like, it's not been touched by hands until the very end. Um, it's, you know, you know, the soil has been basically just pumped full of fertilizer to grow. Even then the earth provided, the earth does what she knows how to do. And she is a nurturer that we depend on the earth to nurture us and, um, take care of us in that way. And so just remembering that gratitude, going back to the basics, like Whatever, you know, this food might have gone through hell to get to me, you know, this piece of lettuce, really, like, you know, like, even if it's been machine harvested, it's been brought in trucks using fossil fuels, like 3000 miles, whatever, like whatever food you have access to, because not everyone can afford this organic um, food that's created you know, by the farm down the street. Not everyone has access to that. So wherever you are, just start with that food. And um, it's an invitation to connect with that. And I always imagine it, you know, I always, this is my favorite practice is so simple. It doesn't need to involve anybody else. Um, I, this is a side, but when I first started getting into ceremony and food, I would kind of like try to reel in everyone around me and create the community that I so desired. And I'd be like, okay, everybody, let's hold hands. Let's sing a gratitude song, but oh. not, that's not a great start for people because <laughs> it's such an individual journey. And um, I would say before you try to change people to create a community, just, just create that connection for yourself. It could be different for you. What it is for me is I just, have a moment of silence. I close my eyes. I inhale my food. I like I inhale aromas and I just let those molecules permeate my being. And I imagine like I let my um, mind's eye go to all the different processes and all the different um, forces of nature that had to happen in order for the food to come to me. So you know, I, you know, the sunlight, the rain, the water, the soil, all the soil microbes you know, all the nutrients in that soil. And like, and I think, you know, like how long did it take for that soil to form originally? You know, it might've taken millions of years. So it's like everything. And then all the people that harvested it, the trucks. And it's just like, when you, when you hold that in your, in your mind's eye, I can just feel my heart opening and I receive the food differently. And it's so different when I'm rushing through a meal and I don't do that. Um, I might not even chew very much. So it's just a different experience that it's an invitation for everybody to start with. I remember in college, Professor Gerber um, in Sustainable Living brought that up to us. He's a legend. He is. He is. I try this to get him John on the Gerber. show. He won't get at, on the at show. At UMass. <laughs> we'll just keep talking about him. But um, he, you know, I just remember in the lecture hall, him really inviting us to consider how many people and how many vehicles and how many days it took to get food to our plates. And I, it, I never thought about food again after that. And I think another thing that I learned that was so pivotal for me was when I was doing my health coach training at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, they talked about how digestion starts with your eyes. As soon as you look at the food, the body starts to respond. Mm. And so if we just barely even look at our food and we're driving and we're swigging something down or, you know, it's in a smoothie and we're not even chewing it. It, it. Everything's so fast, fast, fast. So stopping just for a minute to even think about it and look at it creates a whole different digestive experience. Yeah. Not and there's even, this, this like funny thing around like the color of eggs, for instance, like, you know, the white egg and the brown egg, everybody is like, well, the brown egg must be better. Right. Well, um, one of my favorite cookbook authors and people is J. Kenji Lopez Alts, which I highly recommend. He does the, the he did the food lab. Um, and he does these like, he takes a scientific approach to food where he'll do these 
uh, experiments and you'd be like, which method is better? Like, how can you make the best, you know, uh, enchiladas or, you know, pulled pork enchiladas or something. Um, and he actually did a study with white eggs and brown eggs. And he's like, well, actually, scientifically, they're exactly the same. They have the same nutrition, the same taste, um, but people enjoy brown eggs better. And when you enjoy the brown egg better, brown eggs better, it actually tastes better to you. So I, I, I do agree, you know, it does begin with food, looking in your eyes, like the colors, looking at all the colors, the textures, um, presentation, I mean, you, we don't face that. We, like we don't have time to present our food to ourselves, right? <laughs> so you go to a restaurant for that. But if you take an asturtium from the garden and you put it there, like your whole plate is transformed because you're like, wow, like this, what a beautiful presentation of food, right? For um, those who don't know what an asturtium is, it's an edible flower and it's beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, one of those beautiful edible flowers. I want to tell one more story about spiritual connection to food. So um, I do grow a little bit, definitely in college, I grew a lot more and I was working for farms and getting most of my, well, all of my produce from farms. Um, and, and you also mentioned CSA. So for those that don't know what CSA is, it's community supported agriculture. And I promise you that there are farms nearby to you and it may be within budget, it may not. Um, but oftentimes it does come out to be cheaper, I found, than groceries. If you pay ahead of time um, of the growing season to the farmer, you end up getting a weekly or bi-weekly box of what they're growing that, that time period. And what you're doing is you're giving the farmer um, reliable income and you're getting food with love that's fresh mm -hmm. and local. Um, and so definitely check that out. Google CSA near me if you want to learn more about that. But back mm -hmm. to the story. So I'm not growing that much food these days, but I did put in two blueberry bushes for years ago. And it's been such a nice. journey for me. The first year, there's very, barely any berries. The second year, I put netting around it and a chipmunk got caught in it. And I had to free him or her or they. And um, it was really upsetting for me because this chipmunk was basically hanged. And if I didn't find it, it would have died. Then a couple months later, I found a dead one. And I thought, okay, I can't have netting around this. This is not worth it. It's not fair. And I buried these chip, this chipmunk and I felt so guilty. So this year I put together boxes um, around the blueberries so that it was, you know, structured and, and a chipmunk couldn't get in and strangle itself and whatnot. So I was so excited this year because the blueberries were growing and the, I knew those birds couldn't get in and I was sorry to tempt them, but not my bushes. And mm -hmm. I was nibbling on them for a couple of days. And then I went away for a weekend and I came home and they were all gone. So somebody snuck underneath and got it. And I thought, okay, I got some of them. Somebody else was hungry. I'll try to think about other ways to deter them in the future, but you know, at least they were enjoyed. Mm -hmm. I go for a walk and I'm feeling like, okay, you know, they were nice. Maybe next year I'll enjoy them again. And I just get this feeling to go off trail and I do. And I come across a blueberry tree. I've never seen a blueberry tree before. It was this I've never seen bush. a blueberry was, tree either. It was probably 15 feet tall, wow. uh, maybe higher. And it was filled with wild blueberries. And I'm just standing there in wonder. I couldn't believe it. I actually made an Instagram reel about that sounds this. So I'm so, I was so inspired. So I'm eating it and I'm thinking, where are the birds? How did this happen? And I couldn't even eat them all. I was just eating to my heart's delight. I felt like a little kid. And I just sat, stood there in gratitude. And I stopped myself and I thanked the tree and I thanked the universe because I realized I was just in such a rush to eat all these berries. Like I was in <laughs> scarcity. And I paused and I left. I left with plenty of blueberries on the tree and I was just in so much delight that, you know, I, I came to peace with my blueberries that had been eaten, but, but the land provided and I got this feast. And so I just wanted to share that story because not because I think I did something grand, but just that there's food all around us and that we can have joy and pleasure with it. And it's not just about, you know, am I eating a four star five course meal, but how can you find 
any sort of connection and joy with food and allow that to start to penetrate your meals or your snacks and um, wild crafting is probably for a whole nother episode, but there's something about the empowerment and the sovereignty and the connectedness of being able to harvest food from the wild confidently and feel that just from the wild earth. Yeah, I love that story. It's like um, Hansel and Gretel or something. <laughs> but what came to me as you were speaking was just that the earth provides. Um, I think that, you know, sometimes I get into this doom and gloom mindset around lack um, and, you know, population growth and the state of the environment and things like that. It's really easy to spin out on that kind of mindset. It really um, is. And to also feel guilty about privilege. And I think that's something that a lot of, um, con you know, self-conscious people in the Western world uh, have this, like this guilt of like, oh, I'm lucky enough to have this, to shop at Whole Foods, for instance. Like, actually, to be honest, um, I've only just recently gotten over my cultural shock every time I enter Whole Foods, because, you know, in Taiwan, there's no Whole Foods. In Guatemala, there's for sure no Whole Foods. Um, and, it's just like you go into the store, it's like, oh my gosh, this place is just fully stocked with all this like organic, you know, super elite, expensive yeah. food. Um, and then there's just like the simplicity of the blueberry bush. Um, actually, mm -hmm. Mother Earth provides, and there is enough food for us all if we, if, you know, if we as a human species can really remember the way that nature works to produce food and that there's a balance. And what you said about sharing the food with deciding not to, you know, do the netting um, with wildlife and things like that. It's like for, for millennia, humans have kind of been in the struggle with nature, with um, competitors for our food. And food is, you know, there's a saying that um, we're always nine meals away from a revolution. In other words, if we don't eat for three days, all hell is going to break loose. And that's how important food is. And food has been used as even like a, a method to control people and to keep people in fear. So, you know, like having that ability, just, you know, eat. my mother used to go into our lawn in um, this apartment complex in Connecticut. And she'd go, she'd be like, this would be this like whole lawn full of dandelions. And she, she'd be like, oh my gosh, look at all these dandelions. She'd pick the leaves. I used to be ashamed when I was a little kid because I was like, oh my gosh, we're so poor that my mom is picking dandelion greens from the lawn. But then later on when I like started to learn about herbalism and just the power of the dandelion mm -hmm. that represents, uh, you know, dandelion. I've seen dandelions growing through pavement. Um, and I had a roommate that would make dandelion wine from the flowers. And when I, I, when I like connected with that, I was like, wow, that was my mom leaning on her cultural wisdom that she had preserved in her memory from her mother and that people all around the world, like, you know, dandelions grow in, in Massachusetts. They grow in Korea where she grew up, um, where they were seen as like a yummy delicacy to eat these like young spring greens. So yeah, food sovereignty, it's like, if you have that knowledge to know um, even something that's like medicinal that you can put in your tea and um, it's not like wild foods, they have actually, I think it was like up to a hundred times more nutrients than um, farm produced food, industrial mm -hmm. agriculture produced food. And that has to do with um, the soil that they're growing in and the nutrients there around them and their genetics as well. So having just dab like dabbling a little bit and even something like growing a tomato can be so empowering. There's like another meme that goes around. You can tell that I'm a fan of memes. And it's like th things that give people a feeling of power. And it's like one, it's like, you know, like writing a book or <laughs> um, giving a speech. And then it's like, this graph is like growing a tomato. It's like the top of the list, right? So if you can have like, even, you know, a bucket, a five gallon bucket and grow a tomato on your patio or something on your balcony. That is something that is like one thing that you can do to start 
on this path of sovereignty and then learning just what are, what is around you? What are some weeds around you that are probably like they're more nutritious than this, the salad greens that you're getting probably. Um, of course you have to be careful not to get, you know, things too close to the road. I've been sprayed with chemicals and things like that. So, but there's just like a world waiting to explore around our connection to food. It's, it's wherever you are, you can start there. I'm so glad you brought up the weeds. You know, dandelions, I think was one of the first plants I learned about in herb school for a liver tonic. Every part of the plant is medicinal and it is the most common plant that we try to get rid of. And um, yeah, if you go to a farm and you see those weeds growing in the field, those are just as nutritious, if not as nutritious as the plants the farmer's growing. So getting to know your local weeds and as Ifan said, be careful not to grab them out of the sidewalk or close to the street or off of um, runoff from the road, but there are weeds everywhere and they are super nutritious and they're doing so great because they're so strong. And mm -hmm. so um, the energetics of food, I re also remember learning that in health coach school. And, and you know, this is a bit elitist, but she said, you know, imagine the energy of a wilted plant. Why would you put that energy into your body? You know, you want the most fresh and, you know, that's the problem with our grocery stores is they're filled with filtered out plants. You know, they're getting rid of the ugly ones. They're genetically engineering out the ugly ones. Everything needs to be perfect and shiny and round. Um, and that's not a reflection of the nutritional values you shared with the eggs. So just, you know, really checking in with how you feel after what you eat and letting that be one of the guides, not just Google, but observing your own body. And, yeah, um, I love all of that. There's so much there um, that you're bringing up. And, you know, one thing is around uh, herbs, the taste of herbs, like a lot of them are very bitter mm -hmm. and it's an acquired taste because conventional agriculture has bred out that taste of bitterness because we humans, we are just gravitating towards sweet yeah. and, you know, sweet, the sweeter the corn, the better. And, um, and actually in Chinese medicine, bitter is really super important. I, I'm not, I didn't study that, but I know that like, I actually like the taste of bitter greens. Helps with digestion. I, it, it's great for digestion. It helps clean your blood. Um, and it's just, so in Chinese we say bu shi, it means it fortifies your blood. So, um, you know, we've been bred, kind of like brought up to, to really want these really super palatable foods or palatable foods, but bitter and like all these other tastes like, like maybe mucilaginous or a little bit sour, like purslane. Um, we're not accustomed to that. So you have to like start slow and be like, you maybe add it to your regular salad greens and kind of build there um, to create that. If you, you know, you want that relationship to grow. And um, also you said around like super perfect looking food um, actually have a story when I lived on a farm in Western Massachusetts, we would get eggs from our chickens and there were these beautiful, like green, blue, light brown, mm. tan, like pink, um, eggs. And I would like bring them home to my family and some of them would be covered in poop <laughs> and like, yep. like, you know, a little piece of feather or something, not horribly, but just like a little piece. Cause they're just raw. I didn't clean them yet. And um, my brother at the time, he was probably in high school. He looked at them. He was like, did these eggs come out of the butt of a chicken? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And he was like, ew, gross. Right. <laughs> and then I was just like, well, where do you think the eggs that you're eating came out of? You know, um, but it was not just the like, kind of, <laughs> no, definitely not the butt. <laughs> and um, it, it was a little bit of a wake up call. Like, I think a lot of people would have that exact same reaction and there's no judgment there. It's kind of funny, but um, that's kind of like the disconnect that we have that if there's, if it doesn't look perfect, if it's got soil on it, if it's like, you know, misshapen or whatever, uh, that gets tossed out in, in the conventional supermarket chain. So there actually, you know, there are now, thankfully there are these, um, services that will take these vegetables that are not perfect and then they'll resell them and they're organic and everything. So there's something called Misfit Market. You could look into that. They take the, the ugly vegetables and then you can get that shipped to your door um, 
direct from farmers. So, you know, there are things happening that you can tap into if you don't have access to the CSA. Now you can order food online and have it sent to you. So this is one, one option that you can look into. So Ethan mentioned purslane, which is both mucilaginous and sour and a weed that I, if you're in Massachusetts, I know is growing near you. So keep a lookout for it. Yet yeah, not everyone loves it, but it, you know, just starting to even pay attention is going to bring you more inspiration and connection to food and just recognizing that it's growing around us, right? It's, it's, it's wild. It's not just at the grocery store. Um, I was waitressing for a while. Um, and I remember that a woman wanted a po' boy and she said but not if the shrimp have its head on it I don't want to know that it was alive oh this is such a huge thing in Taiwan because Taiwanese people you know Asian cultures we we love things with heads on them <laughs> shrimp you know fish heads like, <laughs> all this stuff right fish head soup <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah oh, so and great. so and you know my Part of my heritage is from Norway and I just remember in being in Norway and watching my uncle suck the central part out of the shrimp that it was a delicacy and it's poop and just being I was I think I was young and I was just my mother horrified. has like you know my mother could uh deep <laughs> deep uh, shell a uh, shrimp with only her mouth and her chopsticks, you know, her hands would never touch Amazing. it. And then she would love eating the eyes from the fish. Yes. Yeah. That's good for your eyes actually. Well, and like the sense. same with like, you know, um, animal feet, like chicken feet. So we have like steamed chicken feet in Taiwanese and Chinese cuisine. That's really good for your skin. If you want to stay young, um, that's full of collagen. Same with like pig trotters. I never really liked pig trotters, but when you like, you have to cook them for a really long time and you, you know, you add soy sauce and ginger and all this like stuff, but they, you know, it's just, it's so good for you. And these are the ancestral traditions that like we can look back into, um, you know, everyone, every culture, if you look back far enough has something like, you know, you're eating the animal from head to tail and eating these quote unquote weeds um, like these wild or semi-wild plants. So everywhere, anywhere you look, if you go back, if you want to, if you're curious and you dig, you'll find something and you'll be like, ew, or, oh my gosh, that's different. But that's where the real like nourishing power is. And, and we're that, missing that in modern, in modern culture. And you touched on, um, the bitters that are lost in culture and even our fermented foods are now pasteurized. And that's not even making it to us from the store. Don't worry, they have and sugar added to them. Organ meats. So, you know, even eyes, thyroid and liver, like these are all parts that we were eating that were helping keep us vital. And, mm -hmm. um, the, just the aspect of connection to what we're eating, right? Like this idea, like, ew, I don't want to know it was alive. So I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about, um, the spirituality of hunting food, killing it and, you know, there was an article going around years ago, um, kind of poking fun at vegans. Like, what are you, you're killing plants. Do you not believe in the soul of plants? So yes, like there is death involved um, with all food, whether it's animals or plants. And yeah. of course, you know, industrial agriculture, one way or another, it's, it's impacting the environment. And yes, cows is much more impactful than um, farming food, you know, plants. But I'd love you to talk a little bit about that that death life connection. Yeah, thank you for that. That's such a great topic. And I, I was going to bring that up too. So um, I was not brought up personally in a hunting family and I was an environmentalist growing up. Um, and I was under this belief that hunting was bad for animals. And I would be, you know, I was leaning more towards the activist part of things. Um, and that's why I became a vegetarian. So I was a vegetarian for two years in college. And that all changed when I started to live on the farm in Western Massachusetts, where we raised our own animals. We raised our own sheep, we raised our own cows, we raised our own chickens and turkeys. Um, and in the fall, we had a big lamb slaughter, um, you know, these year old lambs. And I remember I was living at the time with um, an older couple and uh, this woman who was, she, she sent her lambs off to slaughter them and we had named these lambs, right? Like they had personalities. Um, she was just bawling because 
it's so, you know, when you like actually kill your food, it's so different than when you are just picking it up. It's already prepared by the butcher from the store and like you don't, you're not connected to that visceral part of it. So she said something to me that I will forever remember. And she said, you know, I used to, she was bawling to me because she said that. She said, I used to think that meat was toxic. Meat was bad. Meat is bad for the earth. Um, but now I realize that it's medicine. And I feel like very emotional saying that because I do feel that, you know, like there is such a, um, I would say just a villainization of meat and hunting. And I, I would say I, I don't support trophy hunting, um, especially, you know, rare or endangered animals. That's like an ego trip in my mind. But hunting is something that we, nearly every culture in our ancestry, if you go back far enough, we had to do that to survive. We actually would not have become the humans that we are now if we didn't eat meat. Um, you know, our, our brains went, would have been much smaller. Our jaws would have been a lot smaller. And it's like, there are anthropologists that hypothesize that it is because of our relationship with the sacred hunt and with eating animal protein that it, we were able to become human um, to have this brain capacity that we have now. So I know it's a controversial subject because you know, there's so much belief tied into around food. And I don't discount anyone who is a vegetarian. If you're, you have, you have your own reasons, it's religion, there are religious reasons, there are environmental reasons, there are health reasons, um, there are, you know, animal welfare reasons. There are so many reasons to be vegetarian and, and I've been that, but around hunting, um, be, having been around hunters myself as, as someone that did nature education, we, we would actually have a lot of hunters who were part of our instructor core team. Sometimes they would bring in, um, for example, one person, he was, he's a turkey hunter. And so that's his favorite Bob. game to hunt. Yeah, Bob. Um, I love reading his stories of each turkey hunt. And every time he, he shares something about each hunt, you know, every hunt is so different and so captivating to read. It's like, oh, I, you know, I, I decide this is my strategy and this is what I heard, but like, you know, but this turkey weren't, the turkeys weren't coming my way. And so I snuck in around this way and like, voila, there was one in front of me or I didn't get it this time. And it's just like, he has such an incredible connection with the food because he's hunting these turkeys for food. And at the end of everything that he shares, he's, he shares gratitude for the turkey and how beautiful it is and how you know, his heart is moving. And since I know Bob, I know that he's actually moved to tears when he talks about the turkeys giving their life for him. And um, not only that, but they've taught him so much about being in nature because through the pursuit of hunting, he has had to learn the language of nature, of the birds, of the topo topography of the seasons. And that is such an immense gift you know, he has to wake up before dawn to go out and he sees these amazing sunrises. And it's like, you know, thank you turkeys for giving this gift to me. And so a lot of um, indigenous cultures, they have their own traditions around hunting. Um, I can't speak to that personally because I have not hunted my own game. I have killed my own chickens. And that is like, that is also like someone had to teach me how to do it. And it, it was different. You know, it's different. It forever changed me to to kill, slit the throat of these chickens. Um, but they have like uh, beliefs around some of them. Um, once you hunt the animal, you tie um, a piece of cloth over the animal's eyes because it's considered disrespectful to allow the animal to continue to see through his eyes because the spirit is in his eyes and you want to allow the spirit to return. So there are so many traditions that I don't even know how to speak to, but, you know, if someone is really, um, I would say anti-hunting, then it's really your decision, but I would say, you know, let, the, let it, let, let there be an invitation to look at what is a spiritual, be, spirituality behind it, and um, what is a, what is the respectful way to be in relationship with our food? 
those are such beautiful stories and it really is a touchy subject. I actually recorded a podcast episode on animal, animal communication earlier, earlier this week that's not oh. released. So talking about the souls of animals that they very much have consciousness and, and feeling. So um, adds a whole nother layer to this conversation. I remember, I don't know if it was Neil or Tyler, but they, one of them brought in roadkill. Um, and I had a, a, a close friend in college who would, who would, um, he was a deer hunter, but he would also stop if he saw deer on the side mm -hmm. of the road and see I if have, it was I have in full disclosure, and you probably know this, I've eaten quite a lot of roadkill. <laughs> and it, it's, it's yeah. that reverence for life yeah. and for, and resource and being part of nature, um, and not being so disgusted if somebody, if something isn't pretty. Um, so I have a lot of respect for that. And, Absolutely. um, I know from Jewish culture, kosher um, killing of animals. I, I do know somebody who really tried to get involved in um, the industry because they weren't being pastured. They were just feedlot animals, just like everything else, but the killing process was kosher. So it involved a sharp enough knife so that death was almost instantaneous um, mm -hmm. and blessing and prayer. And so um, I think that it does change the dynamic so much when there's respect for the life that you're taking. Mm -hmm. It's not just what I need. And um, for those people who can sustain on vegetarian diets, I bow to you. I'm grateful to you. I have, you know, been somebody with chronic illness my whole life. And so I have yet to thrive on a vegetarian diet. And I know that it's, you know, not ideal for our climate and for our earth and the way that we're farming it isn't. Well, I want to interrupt you there because there's also a lot of misinformation about that too. So it is true that if you raise livestock in the conventional, you know, this CFA, CAFO way, which is, it stands for concentrated animal feed feeding operation. So that's like, if you go and buy meat at Costco or whatever grocery store, it's just regular meat it's gonna be raised that way. It's gonna be fed grain. It's gonna be relating, releasing a ton of methane gas. It's gonna be pumped full of antibiotics. It's, you know, that's the meat that vegetarians are demonizing and is true. If, if possible, you, you should avoid that meat because it's not great for our planet. Um, it's not great for the animal's health. It's not great for your health because of all the stuff that's in there. Um, it's also like inflammatory meat because it's, right. it's very high in omega-6 fatty acids, which is if you have too much of it, it's inflammatory for your system. So on the other hand, if you have livestock that's raised in a regenerative way, they're, so they're livestock, livestock aren't grazers. And what they do is like on grasslands, which is nature's, you know, it's nature's bounty for the livestock. The livestock are the ones that um, actually add the fertilizer and nutrition and they manage the grasslands. They, they, they are what allow the grasslands to flourish. And um, if you look, I've seen pictures of the difference between a regeneratively managed grassland um, versus, you know, conventionally yeah. raised, you know, it's one side is green and lush and is full of diverse native plants and grasses and flowers. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, it's just barren. It's just, yeah. you're, you have to pump in fertilize, artificial fertilizers to keep the, anything growing in that soil. So cows, if managed correctly, they absolutely do provide more nutrition and nourishment for the land and it is healthier. Um, that's a whole nother subject, um, but I would say, you know, don't demonize meat. Just look at like, how is it grown? And, yeah. and, and maybe I, eat, less of, maybe eat less of it, but eat better quality meat. And I will link um, a bunch of resources in the description for this episode, but Joe Solitan, a rotational grazing, there are ways to integrate resource, other yeah. animals into the landscape and other plants. So perennial grasses can actually be carbon sinks. So as Yvonne's talking about the difference between conventionally raised me and the grasslands versus uh, regenerative, you know, making sure that the proper plants are there that are perennials that are able to sequester carbon. Um, and before we took over the US, buffalo would wild, uh, would, would roam wild and they would actually aerate the soil and fertilize it and continue the, the um, grasslands mm -hmm. um, and regenerate. 
but with the amount of meat we're producing for McDonald's and Burger King and, and that sort of thing and taking over the range in the, in the industrial way. In the industrial That's... way. So what we're speaking to is in the industrial way, which is the dominant way now. So it's mm -hmm. important to bring light to that. And as you're sharing and we're talking about, there is there are ways to get meat um, that is having reverence for the environment and getting you even more nutrition. Yeah. And, you know, animal foods are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. Like liver is the number one. And a lot mm -hmm. of people think liver is full of toxins, but actually it's not. Liver's role is to detoxify and where toxins are stored would be in fat. So, you know, look, if you are getting conventionally raised meat, that's a very fatty cut. That's what you would want to be, you know, aware of. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's actually a documentary called Sacred Cow, and it kind of ties us back into the spirituality of things. So like in India, the cows are sacred animals. And so this documentary sheds light on this, this, um, basically it's a narrative around, um, you know, you have to be a vegetarian in order to save the planet or, and all animal meat is bad. So it's, there's nuances there for sure. Like the eating the industrially raised animals, um, that's, I wouldn't say that's the best option for sure. But, you know, look into the nuances, do some, do some research into that and, and look up Sacred Cow. I haven't seen that yet. I look forward to checking it out. Um, there's so much more to go over. Um, I think we're already at an hour. Do you wanna continue? Well, maybe we could just wrap it up and um, uh, yeah, with food, I mean, food is, it's kind of like food is life, right? We all need it to, to survive. We all need it to grow, like, you know, in order to create and produce and uh, maintain. So I would say, just say in, in closing that um, I hope that what we've shared here is something like it has piqued your curiosity and interest to go and explore your own ancestral traditions. Even if you don't have access to that immediately, you can, you can, you can start with Google. You can start with reaching out to family. You can start somewhere, you know, there's some thread there that you can start to follow and just be curious about where that leads you. And the other part is to listen to your body and to your body's wisdom. So, um, you know, to bring in that mindfulness while you're eating, that gratitude, and to start to build your own relationship to food that feels good for you. It's going to be different for everybody, and that's okay. And slowly through time, you'll, you'll also meet people who have their own relationship with food. And that's where the fun is, where you share all the different cultural traditions. And, and I would love to see a place where people are sharing a meal of different, you know, they can share, oh, this is what we do in my culture. And then, okay, now, like, and then maybe someone else takes turns, like, okay, now, now I'll share something that happens uh, special to me in my culture around food. So that would be so much fun to participate in. That's such a sweet invitation. And I just wanna leave with one more resource that was impactful for me when I started my food journey, which was Nourishing Traditions. And it's That's been fabulous. years, years since I read this book. So I don't even remember what, if they even had Jewish traditions in it, but I just remember Sally Fallon talking about how fat and cholesterol is demonized too. So check out that book if, if you're interested. I'm sure there's plenty more that can, you know, touch on different indigenous diets. But as this episode is an invitation for you to dive deeper into your connection with food, I just want to say that Ifan offers both individual and group coaching and classes. So I will link her information in the description if you want to reach out to her and be notified of upcoming group, group coaching programs. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching with her, Ifan, it's been so fun to share our stories together and hear Thank your perspective you. on these topics. I yeah, agree with everything you said. <laughs> so it's, it's always <laughs> nice when I get to talk to somebody and they can you know, share different aspects of things I believe in that I didn't yet know. So thank you for thank you. sharing thank all you so much you know. for the invitation. And I just want to share that I am starting a group course that it's kind of the foundations of good health and nutrition and um, our relationship to food will be one of those pillars. So if you're interested in learning more or being a part of my waitlist, then you can 
um, just email me in, in the link that we'll provide. Thank you so much, Yifan. See you next time. Thank you.